A very good evening. We're coming to you live and direct from the News First Center here in Colombo with the latest headline making news from here at home and across the world. This is Primetime News. I'm Mahina Bongzel. And I'm Madhush Kabal. Surya, let's start off with a look at your headlines. The mortal remains of the late chief prelate of the Askiri chapter to be brought to the island tonight. Speaking informs UPFA General Secretary and MPs to decide on the position of opposition leader. Although bill to increase T-bill debt ceiling was defeated, funds can be raised through bonds, a statement from Deputy Minister Dr. Harsha De Silva. Clashes break out between councillors and officials at the Panadura Urban Council. The mortal remains of the late chief prelate of the Askari chapter of the Siam sect, most venerable Udugama Sri Buddha Rakitathero, is to be brought to the country late tonight. The final rites of the chief prelate will be observed with full state honours in Kandy on Sunday. Most venerable Udugama Sri Buddha Rakitathero passed away during the early hours of this morning while receiving treatment at a hospital in Singapore. The mortal remains of the chief prelate will be taken to the Asgiri Mahavihare in Kandy tomorrow morning. Preparations have been made for the public to pay their respects to the late chief prelate on either side of the Colombo Kandy Road. Therefore, the body of Venerable Udugama Sri Buddha will lie at the Asgiri Mahavihare until the 12th of this month. <laughs> The working committee of the Sangha Council at the Asgiri Mahavihara convened under the patronage of the Anunayaka Most Venerable Galagama Sri Atadasitero this morning to discuss matters relating to the final rights and future course of action. The discussion which was held at the Asgiri Vihara saw the attendance of a group of officials including the Diyavadana Nilame, Kandy District Secretary and the Commissioner of Buddhist Affairs of the Kandy District. Discussions took place to perform the final rites on the 12th of this month. The funeral will take place at the police grounds. We have decided to announce that the 12th of April will be a national day of mourning. The late most venerable Udugama Sri Buddha is considered as a superior Sangha mentor for his impeccable service to the Buddha Sasana and society. Born under the name Jasundara Mudyansalage Amrasingha on the 17th of March 1930 in Udugama, Dambadinya Kurunagala, he was ordained as Udugama Sri Buddha Rakitatero in 1945. After the demise of most venerable Pali Pana Sri Chandananda Mahanayaka Tero on the 13th of December 1999, Udugama Sri Buddha was elevated to the position of Chief Prelate. Most venerable Udugama Sri Buddha rendered an impeccable service to the Buddha Sasana by pioneering the construction of the Pallikale International Buddhist Centre and administrating several viharyas and ashrams. Disregarding his own health, most venerable Udugama Sri Buddha engaged in countless amounts of sasana and social work. A prime example would be the instance when the chief prelate arrived at Adam Speak just recently. Most venerable Udugama Sri Buddha is known for guiding state administration towards the path of righteousness through the practices of the Dhamma. No matter what position he was offered, he was always humble. When decisions needed to be taken, the most venerable was always firm in taking those decisions. The demise of the chief pledge will be felt as a big loss to us all. Issuing a message of condolence, President Maithripala Sirisena states that he and his government are deeply saddened by the passing of Agga Maha Pandita, Most Venerable Udugama Sri Buddha Rakta Thero, the Chief Prelate of the Askari Chapter of the Siam Sect. 
In his message, the president recalls the yeoman service rendered by the most venerable Thero to the Mahasangha as well as the Buddha Sasana. In his condolence message, President Maitri Palasirisena recalls the manner in which the chief prelate carried out Theva rituals for the sacred tooth relic. The president stated that as most venerable Buddha Rakita Thero grew older, wiser and attained more titles, it was the Buddha Sasana in the country which benefited the most from his wisdom. President Maitri Palasirisena also recalls that the chief prelate engaged in a number of social activities aimed at helping the less fortunate, key among them being the establishment of the Buddha Rakita Foundation. The condolence message also goes on to state that his work both in Sri Lanka and overseas in spreading the message of Buddhism brought glory to the Buddha Sasana as well as to the country. President Sirisena concludes his condolence message by wishing that the late most venerable Udugama Sri Buddha Rakita Thero attains Nibbana. President Maitripala Sirisena arrived in the island last night, concluding his state visit to Pakistan. Following his arrival, President Sirisena attended a function at the Presidential Secretariat today. This event was held to provide electricity to 12,850 rural families in view of the dawn of the Singhala Tamil New Year. At the event, President Maitripala Sirisena symbolically declared open the electricity scheme. <laughs> No matter what we speak about or how we speak about it, the main aspect in terms of a country's development in a political point of view should be the eradication of poverty. You are aware that when tackling the issue of poverty and strengthening the rural economy, electricity plays an extensive role. Electricity contributes largely in terms of strength and especially guides the development of the rural community in terms of self-employment in the industrial sector. Therefore, when developing the country, electricity is an essential factor for the development of rural areas just as in urban ones. <laughs> A clash broke out between a group of officials and councillors of the Panadura Urban Council today. Three people, including a councillor, were injured in the clash. The police said that an administrative officer has been arrested. The clash broke out over a proposal presented to the Urban Council to remove the secretary of the Panadura Urban Council. According to our correspondent, the administration officers of the Urban Council voiced their opposition to the removal of the secretary while the council meeting was in progress. The opposition who opposed the proposal boycotted the meeting. The officials who voiced their protest over the matter entered the chambers when the council session commenced with the attendance of three UPFA urban councillors. This is how events unfolded afterwards. Our correspondent said that the councillor who was injured in the clash has been admitted to the Kalutara General Hospital, while the two officials who were also injured have been admitted to the Panudara Base Hospital. Welcome back to the news. Speaker of the House Chamal Rajapaksa has informed the General Secretary of the UPFA and its members to discuss amongst themselves the issues surrounding the position of the opposition leader and inform him on their decision. Speaking in Parliament today, the Speaker made this comment in response to a question raised by MP Kumaravelgama. The affidavits of a majority of opposition members of Parliament citing that the leader of the Mahajan Exat Peramana be appointed as the opposition leader has been presented to you. We are awaiting your decision on the leadership of the opposition. As an opposition, we have not been able to convene a proper opposition meeting over this issue of national importance. We request that the former leader of the House, who was able to face any situation, be appointed as the opposition leader in order to face the situation and also to maintain a healthy democracy and to safeguard it. This is an internal issue of the opposition. You are seeking our assistance to appoint an opposition leader. 
When you deduct the number of persons who were given positions of ministers, state ministers and deputy ministers, there are only 106 MPs left in this chamber. The majority is 54 members. More than 54 affidavits have been presented to you. I do not see this as a tough decision to make. I am bound by your decision. I will respect your decision. I have not taken the right away from anyone to call for a vote. Therefore, if you need to present wrong facts and take the position of opposition leader, so be it. Do not stab us in the back. The public who voted for the symbol of the beetle leaf of the United People's Freedom Alliance have not permitted us to go to the UNP's arms. This I said politically. You need to understand that in order to continue your work in the government, you cannot have an opposition. If there is a group in the opposition that has given their consent to the appointment of the Prime Minister, can you continue to identify them as members of the opposition? You need to understand who is in the opposition. Therefore, I request the MPs who wish to be identified as the opposition to rise up in this chamber. The Central Committee approved of this. It was only MP Kumar Velgamu who voiced its objection to this at the Central Committee meeting. It is evident that a majority of the SLF peers are in the opposition. General Secretary of the party, Susil Premajayanta, has written to me seeking that Nimal Siripala de Silva be appointed as the opposition leader. If there is a change, that is evident at present. And if you need to work together under one consensus, I propose to Susil Premajayanta himself to discuss this matter with all the MPs and resolve this issue and thereby nominate a person to me. <laughs> If such a consensus cannot be reached, will you consider to grant permission for the opposition to function as an independent group? That can be done later. Now work together on this. The manner in which the police functioned with regard to parliamentarian Tiran Alas was subject to criticism in parliament today. Parliament to Mantri Tiran Alas Mantri to Mabe Gay. The police headquarters, through a news broadcast, had informed that the passport of parliamentarian Tiran Alas had been suddenly impounded yesterday. This parliamentarian who holds a diplomatic passport has not been questioned by the police nor has a formal complaint been made against him in court. Therefore, curtailing the privileges of a parliamentarian without a formal complaint is a serious matter. They say, Garu Mantri Varege. If there is an issue, then it is justifiable to question an individual. However, under which law can his children who still attend school be taken in for questioning? Anyone can present a B report. Parliamentarian Tiran Alas was unaware of his passport being impounded until such a decision was announced. If this was not announced through the media and if he was travelling abroad, he would only find out about this at the airport. Furthermore, this issue is over 16 years old. This complaint was made by an organisation known as the Anti-Corruption Front. The Anti-Corruption Front was created by a party belonging to this government. This goes to show that as soon as this front makes a complaint, action is taken without any laws or regulations. Please intervene decisively. I will convene a party leaders meeting with the minister and we will hold discussions. We should protect the rights of parliamentarians. There may be instances where officials engage in certain activities in the hope of obtaining promotions. Since this will be taken up at the party leaders' meeting, I will participate and answer your queries. Prime Minister Ali Vikramasinghe says the Attorney General's Department is compiling a list of specific violations related to the Colombo Port City project, which will be submitted to the company in the near future. 
He was speaking at the interactive dialogue the Prime Minister speaks, organized by the American Chamber of Commerce in Sri Lanka, held in Colombo earlier today. The luncheon meeting and interactive dialogue with the Prime Minister in Colombo this afternoon saw the participation of a distinguished cross-section of the business community, including prominent members of AmCham Sri Lanka. Several ministers were also in attendance. Director of English News at News First, Shamir Rasuldin, moderated the event. We promise people, the young people of this country especially, one million jobs in five years and doubling of household incomes, creating a strong middle class. Those are the economic aims. This is our aim. How do we get there? As we have said, we need a highly competitive market economy. So we have to build the spirit of campaign. We have to be, in my view, the most competitive economy in South Asia and also uh, be able to compete with our, some of our Southeastian neighbors. During the interactive dialogue, the Prime Minister was questioned on what steps are being taken with regard to the Colombo Port City project. No, we have uh, asked the task force headed by Mr. Ajita De Costa to get at a list of all the violations formally from the institutions and the AG, AG we will be drafting a letter which we will say, send to them outlining all the violations and we want to start discussions to sort it out. That's why we allow the retaining uh, walls to be built so that there will be no damage to what has been done so far. The discussion is start, uh, but I, 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 my hunch is it will be after uh, the 19th or 20th when everyone has enjoyed the holidays. State Minister of Defence Ruan Vijay Wadhana was questioned on whether the government would be cancelling contracts relating to the Akuregoda Defence Headquarters project. Well, right now uh, the Akuregoda project is under investigation because there's been uh, a lot of malpractice, um, especially in obtaining m materials for the building. Uh, what we know right now is that the cabinet approval was given for a 20 billion project, uh, but from the estimates uh, for the first phase only, they, they have informed us that it has now uh, most probably, we are looking at a number of 42 billion. Right now, the prime minister as well as the president and the finance minister, and we've been uh, basically looking into how we can continue with the project and yes definitely we'll be retendering and uh, getting the process uh, normalized Deputy Minister Dr. Harsha De Silva says that although Parliament has not approved the proposed increase to the Treasury bill debt ceiling, the required funds can be raised through bond issues. However, he points out that this would further burden the people. The bill presented by the government to increase the Treasury bill debt ceiling by 400 billion rupees was defeated in Parliament yesterday. Deputy Minister Dr. Harsha De Silva said in Parliament yesterday that as a result of using government revenue for debt repayments and interest payments, funds for day-to-day -day expenses were insufficient. As such, the government proposed to increase the debt ceiling on Treasury bills to obtain short-term low interest funding. However, the bill was defeated in Parliament yesterday with a majority of 21 votes. Various views are being expressed at present regarding the absence of the Prime Minister, the Subject Minister and the Opposition Leader when the vote was called. We hope to obtain short-term low interest loans instead of paying high interest. When it reduces further, we can use it for development. It has been proven that there are 52 in Mahindra Vajapaksa's group, like the Vimal Veeravansas, who are looking to defeat Maithi Palas Usena. The Prime Minister and I were not there at the time because after speaking about it and debating it, Nimal Siripala comments by saying that a vote will not be called. The 
Usually, even a funeral committee in the village, which has an approved budget of 1.5 or 2 million, seeks approval when increasing the amount paid to 5,000 rupees. They did not even submit to parliament for what projects and what amount they needed when proposing to increase the debt of the people of this country. On the 8th of January, when Honorable Maitripala Sirisena took charge of this country, there were numerous issues that needed to be resolved instantly. We presented the bill on Treasury bills in order to correct the blatant corruption and fraud they carried out. We presented it to make up for their sins and wastage. The Finance Ministry brought forward a bill to increase Treasury bills by 400 million, although there are 70 to vote for it. There are those in the opposition, the TNA and other parties that work with the government. Collectively, there should be more than 100 votes. We have a problem as to how that number fell to 31. What the opposition leader has done is similar to backstabbing. He was not even there when voting was underway. A group was used to cast votes against. The opposition has stooped to such a level. The UNP government itself did not inform us of their want. Neither the Prime Minister nor the Finance Minister were present yesterday. At the same time, the argument over Arjuna Mahendran has not been concluded. MPs have a problem with pledging support when persons are taken forcefully based on whether the UNP or JVP have called them corrupt. <laughs> And it was a mere exercise of public debt management, treasury management. So the, the opposition tried to paint a picture that we didn't have money to pay salaries and therefore we needed to get $400 billion loan. That was complete bunkum. It's nothing like that. Uh, the entire requirement for this month is only $130 billion, of which we have collected all but $19 billion more. Uh, we now have a very transparent public auction system. So we don't have a tap so that we can at any day, any time issue bonds or paper. So without the tap, we have to go to the, the market and the market auction happens once a week. So we needed some flexibility. All what the government was trying to do was to get some flexibility so we can better manage the public debt and bring down the burden. And when we borrow, we need to borrow at the lowest possible cost to the people. And that's all what we were trying to do. So there's absolutely no loss to the government. The loss is for the people. So the opposition or the section of the opposition uh, went against the people. So they'll have to answer to the people, not us. Now speaking recently on Shakti TV's Minal program hosted by senior journalist J. Sri Ranga, leader of the JVP, Anru Kumari Desanayake pointed out several avenues in which the law can be implemented over the issue surrounding avant-garde security services. Commenting on the same, several lawyers emphasized that implementing the law in this regard should not be delayed. During the Minal program, leader of the JVP, Andrew Kumar Disanayaka, said that action can be taken over avant-garde security service under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the Firearms Ordinance and the Explosive Act. If you are found with a homemade gun, you are charged under the Firearms Ordinance. There are weapons that can overrun a country. The laws are not being implemented. This needs to be implemented. There is a question as to why the law is not being implemented on a person who possesses a large number of firearms and ammunition. Under this ordinance, only the armed forces are permitted to have weapons, and in this case, only under special circumstances. However, where did these weapons go to? What was done with those weapons? All these facts need to be taken into consideration. However, appropriate measures have not been taken over this matter. Therefore, we request that all the legal floating armories and persons involved be dealt with according to the law, devoid of their social status. If not, there is no doubt that good governance will collapse. <laughs> The law does not provide for a private company to store weapons. These weapons were stored within the Gaul Harbour. How can such a large number of weapons be stored in there? The other serious factor here is that the armory was being maintained in the vessel known as the MV Mahanuvara. Although the vessel is owned by the Ceylon Shipping Corporation, it flies the Mongolian flag and not the Sri Lankan flag. 
How can a vessel flagged under another country be anchored in the Gaul Harbour and in Sri Lankan waters? We urge the government to implement the law on everyone. Brusito Palatendakon, a former chairman of the Bank of Ceylon, says that he is mystified by the double standard being followed by the authorities with regard to banking officials. Speaking to News First today, he noted that such decisions could have far-reaching financial repercussions. Well, it appears that it is a, a gross injustice has been done to this employee as a general manager because when we uh, learned the reasons behind his interdiction, uh, the main reason that has been adduced or stated is the opening of the bank branch in Seychelles. So opening of a bank branch in overseas in a foreign country involves a lot of uh, whole series of approvals starting from the cabinet and then coming down to the finance ministry, from the finance ministry to the treasury, treasury to the central bank. It appears to be an out of proportion uh, sort of uh, accusation in the first place and an alleging for some other reason which cannot be explained by us or which is not understood by the public. Well, this leads to another situation. In the context of where the head of the central bank is out on a financial misdoing there. The parliament is opposing a proposal by the government to increase the treasury bill issues, to increase the amount. It is The proposal is defeated. And now, the flagship of the banking industry in this country, Bank of Ceylon, the head is chopped off. So this will have very serious financial repercussions for the country. There is a striking contrast between what has happened to the Bank of Ceylon's general manager and to what has happened to the governor of the central bank, Mr. Arjuna Mahendran. On the one hand, we have somebody who has been following his instructions and with all the due processes. However, the governor of the central bank has admitted to getting it wrong and has cost the country approximately 35 billion rupees, and yet he has gone home on paid leave. Welcome back. The MTV Media Network bagged five top honours at the 2014 State Television Awards Ceremony held at the BMICH last evening. News First claimed three of those top awards at the gala event that was presided by Nandimitra Ekanayaka, the State Minister for Culture and Arts. Productions from the year 2013 were presented with honours during the event last evening. News First Rashmin Rana Singer, the producer of Sitijaya, won the award for the best Sinhala language discussion program. <laughs> news First K. Mayuran won the award for best news reporting in the Tamil language. News First Mahina Bongzo, host of Vantage Point and a regular winner at the State Television Awards, won the award for the Best English TV Programme Presenter. Mahina, who won the Best English News Presenter Award three years consecutively, took home her fourth State Television Awards last evening. <laughs> Meanwhile, Cecil Ratnayak of Sirasa TV won the award for Best Set Design for Sirasa Superstar. Shakti Superstar won the award for the best Tamil musical program. The Sirasa Vesa Kalape organized by the Capital Maharaja Organization Limited together with John Keel's Holdings will take place this time around as well in line with the Vesak Full Moon Poya Day. This year, too, the Vesa Kalape will be centered around the premises of the head office of the MTV NBC network down Braybrook Place, Colombo, too. The organizing committee of the Sirasa Vesa Kalape met with the chief incumbent of the Kalaniya Raja Mahaviharya, Venerable Dr. Kollapitiya Mahinda Sangharakitatero, this morning. 
The discussion took place on the relics that will be provided by the Kalaniya Raja Mahabiharya for the exposition. We are grateful that the Vesak Kalape will create an environment where the whole Buddhist community of the country will be able to witness and pay homage to relics and also to nurture their morals. We have agreed to organize the Sirasa Vesak Kalape in a more broad and organized manner. At the meeting this morning at the Kalaniya Raja Mahavihari, we discussed with the chief incumbent on the manner in which the temple would assist in this endeavor and also the provisions that will be made to pay homage to the relics. And discussions this morning ended successfully. <laughs> We would appreciate the efforts taken by Sirisa TV in organizing for the second uh, consecutive year with John Keels, uh, the Sirisa Vesak Kalapi. So we believe events of this nature, religious event of this nature will certainly help uh, the millions of Buddhist devotees coming from different parts of the country. And they'll be actually get an opportunity to witness something which they have not witnessed before. And also to get involved in the, uh, uh, during the uh, uh, the Vesak or, or the most important festival for most of the Buddhists uh, in, in and around the world. Uh, our small contribution from John Keels will most probably will help the, uh, the devotees coming from different parts of the island and we believe to continue this partnership and we would like to thank Sirasa for the pioneering efforts on organizing such a huge religious festival which is not easy otherwise. Another meeting took place this morning regarding the Agra Shavaka relics that will be placed at the Sirasavasa Kalapaya. The discussion took place at the Agra Shavaka Vihare in Maliga Kanda Mardana under the auspices of the chairman of the Mahabodhi Society of Sri Lanka, Venerable Banagalu Patis Satero. The Agra Shavaka relics are currently placed at the Agra Shavaka Mahavihare in Colombo. This is being done based on the request of the Capital Maharaja organization and the MTV MBC network to provide an opportunity for the masses to pay homage to the relics. Simasaita Capital Maharaja Sangudhaniya, John Kil Samuya Samageko Sangha. The organizing of the Sirisa Vesak Kalape, a joint initiative of the Capital Maharaja Organization Limited and John Kiel's Holdings is taking place successfully. We hope that this will be organized on a much larger scale than in previous years. The Sirisa Vesak Kalape will take place at Braybrook Place this time as well. We kindly request all the devotees to visit the Vesak Kalape this time around as well. We are pleased that John Kiel's Holdings too is assisting in this meritorious deed. Now, in some news related to the conflict in Yemen currently underway, 29 Sri Lankan nationals who were stranded in Yemen returned home this evening. They were among a group of 45 of their compatriots who were brought safely to Djibouti after being evacuated from the port of Hodeida in war-torn Yemen. They were evacuated on board a Chinese vessel and were handed over to the Sri Lankan ambassador in Kenya upon their arrival in Djibouti. Moving into other news now, four miners have been killed in an accident reported from a within a gem mine in Gilimale, Ratnapura. The tragedy was reported this morning from a gem mine in Pagora, Gilimale. The victims are all residents from Gilimale. Their bodies have been placed at the morgue of the Ratnapura General Hospital and the police said that the post-mortem examination will take place tomorrow. Meanwhile, one person who arrived to assist those injured in the accident was also injured and is receiving treatment at the Ratnapura General Hospital. And finally, in sports news, former Sri Lankan test cricketer Kapila Vijay Gunawardana was appointed as the new chairman of the National Select Committee of Sri Lanka Cricket. Issuing a media release, SLC says that the four-member committee appointed today was approved by Minister of Sports Navin Disanayaka. The former National Select Committee of SLC, chaired by Sanat Jayasuriya, resigned from their positions after the conclusion of the ICC Cricket World Cup. The new committee will be chaired by Kapila Vijay Gunavardhana, while the other three members are Amal Silva, Brendan Kurupu and He Vikramaratna. Former Sri Lanka writer and medium fast bowler Kapila Vijay Gunavardhana has represented Sri Lanka in two test matches and 26 ODIs. 
Former wicket keeper Amal Silva has represented Sri Lanka in nine test matches and 20 ODIs, while his fellow committee member Brendan Kurupu, also a former wicket keeper and batsman, has played for Sri Lanka in four test matches and 54 one day internationals. Hemanta Vikramaratna, a former left arm spinner, has played in three ODIs for Sri Lanka. And staying with cricket news now, Sri Lanka great Kumar Sangakkara has been named as the leading cricketer in the world in the 2015 Wisden Cricketers' Almanac. Sangakkara joined India's Virendra Sehwag as the only two players to be named as Wisden's leading cricketer in the world for a second occasion. Sri Lanka's one-day international captain Angelo Matthews was also named as one of the five cricketers of the year, along with Moin Ali, Gary Balance, Adam Lith and Jeetan Patel. And with that, we wrap up this edition of Primetime News. I'm Madhushka Balasurya. But before we finish, may I just congratulate Mahina on her State Television Award. Thank Mahi. you very much, Madhushka. It was indeed a team effort, as news is always about the team and the people behind you. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching us here on Primetime News. I'm Mahina Bongzil. Take care and good night. Good night.